Big 12 Watch. I'm your host, Josh Neighbors. Grayson Grunhafer is here today with us to talk some Baylor. We, Grayson, we've been going through all the Big 12 schools as the offseason hit. Big 12 schools from a football perspective, and I've been trying to find the quarterback battles in the Big 12. There are not many of them. Um, and so we're going to talk about Baylor's quarterback situation. But Baylor hoops is the talk of the town for a couple reasons. Number one, my favorite was was Chip Gaines' Twitter interactions. Just fire. Unreal. Complete fire. <laughs> Unbelievable stuff from, from the Magnolia folks. Um, but Scott Drew turning down Kentucky and staying – uh, in, in favor of going to, uh, you know, or, you know, staying in favor of Baylor, but it's, it's been this interesting off season with college basketball. I think you're seeing this shift because I live in Arkansas. We saw the Arkansas basketball coaching, coaching search. They went after Chris Beard, Ole Miss, not as good of a basketball program as Arkansas, but Chris Beard decides to stay put in Oxford, uh, Jerome tank, K state, like K state's a really good program. I mean, Arkansas has won a championship in the last 30 years, you know, in the nineties, you know, so I think Arkansas gets a little bit of an edge, and they've been in the tops for a while too. A bit of edge there. I mean, they couldn't get Will Wade on board. They were going to Chris Jans, and I think you're seeing this now across college basketball. Coaches staying in certain places in favor of going to others. There's always upward movement, yes, but you know Scott Drew, um, Baylor basketball is his. It, you know, it's Scott Drew is probably if you're talking about all right, describe, give me a sentence that, that describes Baylor basketball. Like, it's got to begin with Scott Drew, right? Yeah, definitely. And, and I think you're talking about this shift, and I think it's really important when we're talking about college basketball to just kind of admit that NIL, which has had just these just crazy consequences on football because you're having to to field, you know, 85 scholarships. Like, you have all this open room, and you got to figure out, you know, how are you going to divvy up your NIL? Whereas in basketball – I mean, you got 12 guys and you're not having to use NIL on that many of them. And so, you know, if you're able to come out and use NIL on like eight guys and like five of them are making, you know, substantial money, um, I think it kind of balances out the playing field. And I think you're seeing that with some of these blue blood programs or programs that, you know, Kentucky is a blue blood, but even Louisville had just this mindset that we're going to get whoever we want. And it's like, no, not really, because things have been balanced out, I think, a little bit in college basketball, which if you're committed to it, if your school's committed to it, I don't think it necessarily matters if you're at Kentucky or if you're at Baylor. I think you have a great opportunity to win regardless, and I think we're seeing that. I mean, it took Kentucky four guys, and they went all the way to Mark Pope, who I think is a good coach, but I think we can all agree that's not who we thought Kentucky was going to be able to get. So I think just things have definitely changed on that side of things for sure. Yeah, it's nuts. It's if you told me a Big 12 coach was going to take the Kentucky job, I would not have been shocked. If you told me Mark Pope was going to take the Kentucky job, I would have been yeah. like, wait, what? Because I mean, it, right. You know, I guess Bill's like, honestly, I mean, if Bill Self left, we saw John Calipari go to Arkansas. So I guess nothing's that strange at this point. But like, I'd be really surprised if Bill Self went there. But even think like TJ Otzelberger would be a good candidate. Jerome Tang would be a good a good candidate. Um, you know, just like you know, name, names that have been candidates for other jobs. Scott Drew obviously right. was. Uh, you know, I'm I'm going to those guys before I even get to Mark Pope, right? But it it does just show you I mean, right the, kind of the the situation. I actually think it's for the better of the sport too. Yeah, I think so too because you see the problems in football. I mean, the disparity from the top you know, to the bottom, like you can have a couple of years in there where you really jump up like TCU did. Um, but it's just, it, it's very, I feel like it's very uncommon. The good news is the 12 team playoff should at least give teams more opportunities to showcase what they can do. But as far as the Scott Drew thing, I mean, you talked about storylines. I mean, what a whirlwind the last two days were. I mean, me Casita in Waco just got just incredible. Yeah, so for those folks who don't know, like tell us, tell the account. story there for people who don't know. Yeah, so there was a picture that Scott Drew posted, and it was kind of, I guess, in the middle of the afternoon um, on the day that he was supposed supposedly going to Lexington to visit Kentucky. So the picture gets posted, and so everyone's like, oh, well, he's not going to Kentucky. There's no way. But then it turns out his family was actually flying to Kentucky uh, to go look at the program. But that picture just blew up Twitter, and, and to make matters even crazier, uh, Kentucky fans were calling the restaurant and having the waiter 
uh, go up and talk to Scott Drew about going to Kentucky or giving him messages during uh, his lunch. And so all of that came together. And then when he decided to stay at Baylor, uh, Baylor Athletics actually posted a video of uh, tortilla chips and salsa right outside the Foster Pavilion. Uh, a little bit of an ode to me, Casita, as well. It just was that was crazy. The Kelly Drew things that came out, his wife, just about how, you know, he's just this. I guess it turned into she didn't want him to go to Kentucky. And so, therefore, he ends up staying at Baylor, even though I think it was very mutual. It was just something they needed to talk about and think about as well as their kids, because they're all so ingrained into the Waco community. But everyone was just like, oh, Kelly Drew's the reason Scott Drew stayed. So you had that kind of side of it as well. So it just was, there were so many things. And and I just felt like it was one of those really weird coaching search moments. And you saw it with the Louisville job as well. Just, wow, Scott Drew turning down both jobs in an off season to stay at Baylor. Um, It it definitely cements his legacy, I think. And it definitely cements the fact that he's probably going to be a Baylor for the rest of his career because I don't think there's another job that is more appealing than the Kentucky job, at least to Scott Drew. Yeah, like Kentucky, I mean, I I was going to say the other day too, like Kentucky basketball is like the best, it's the best job. It is, I mean, it's... Well, it's the most gettable too because Duke and North Carolina always hire from within and Kansas is just that, that... Bill Self is so ingrained there that he's not leaving. So it's like the Kentucky job is the one where they really truly go out of house and try to find the best coach available. So it's a little different. Yeah. And it, it's interesting. You know, I, I thought about this while it was, it's not like Scott, Scott Drew was in no, no danger of losing his job. It's not what I'm implying here, but anytime you win a championship and they did it the, the way they did it, um, you know, they've, they've tried to, I mean, is it fair to say they tried to recreate that in some ways? Like they, they play, I mean, they play a pretty certain style, like, you know, it's playmaking guys on the outside. Yeah. And I think so. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I think so. I think the 2022 team, the year right after the national championship was actually a team that was pretty complete because the championship team was actually really good on defense and really good right. on offense. Um, 2022 was as well. And then from that point on, their defense has just slid. It's been all about the offense. Um, I, you know, I've mentioned this a few times, the Jeremy Sohan thing, just the fact that he was so good in 2022. And then he goes from, oh, you're about to be a first-team All-Big 12 player the next year, potentially the best player in the Big 12, to uh, actually you're going to be a lottery pick after being like the number 60th recruit right. in this class. It just was kind of an unfortunate thing, and they clearly missed him that next year. So, yeah, they're trying to recreate it a little bit, and I think the defensive side is where we can all point to and say they got to get Yeah, back. I think it's also – it's a good reminder, right? Like, it's it's a really – but, uh, you know, I think, like, the the lack of success since championship, I, I think this situation is a good reminder. Of, like, you know, you, you think about losing Scott Drew, you're like, oh, God, no. I, I, know it, I know it hasn't been what we thought. You're like, oh, please, Lord, no. You know, so I almost think it's yeah. kind of a – the flirtation kind of makes it – makes you appreciate it more. And I think, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I think TCU had a little bit of this too, right? Like TCU fans are rightfully upset that, that, that Jamie Dixon has not gone further, but you think about like, you think about him leaving and they gave him an extension because TCU's never made the tournament three straight times. It's never happened. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a historic period of success. And like for Baylor basketball, obviously Scott drew is Baylor basketball in a lot of ways. Yes. They have to adjust certain things about the way they play or, you know, like about, you know, how they build these teams. Yeah. Is, is there a chance that you end up getting, I mean, let's be honest, that three men, that, 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 that championship team had the three men wrecking crew. It was a two way, three men, Loaded. just two man, three way wrecking crew, yeah. which is like really rare to find. I mean, they had an all big 12 guy coming off their bench with Adam right. Flagler, who ends up being one of the best players in the big 12, two years later, Matthew Meyer starts at Illinois right. the last the next year. And he was like the eighth man. And then everyone forgets every day John was probably the best defender in the Big 12. And then he tore his ACL the next year and was just never the never yeah. the same guy. So oh, well, that team was very, very good and very loaded. And then the scoring, obviously, with Butler, Teague, and Mitchell. I was just I outrageous. thought this team had a chance, to be honest. I I because it I mean they never I try to think about a game where they got smoked. They never got smoked this year, right? Like there was not a that the that- Michigan. That State. was the one. That was right. the one. But it was in Detroit. Right. That one. Yeah. It was yeah, like a Saturday afternoon. Like yeah. It was like a weird Saturday yeah. afternoon game in Detroit. Mm-hmm. Home game for Michigan State, a Michigan State team that had been terrible all year. And then Michigan State just shows up and just shoots the lights out. And you're just like, okay, well, you're not winning this one. But yeah, you're right. They were in every game. It just, this team never really felt like a team that had that it factor. 
that had just that, oh, yeah, they're going to go out and, and just take a game from someone. They just didn't really have that. And and it was unfortunate that it didn't all come together. But um, I think they're going to change some things this offseason and, and kind of get back to that t- more like the 2022 team, which unfortunately ran into a Brady Manic who had like 28 points in the first half. And then they had to scratch and claw their way back in what was an epic game. And then North Carolina ends up going to the national championship game. So right. um, I think there'll be more similarities to that team next year um, than this past season. Yeah. And, and look like, I think for Baylor fans, you know, if you're worried about the, having other changes and stuff, it's, it's great indicator of, you know, Hey, like, let's see how good the coach is, but they're not the only school doing it. I mean, it's being taught. We're talking about this at UVA right now, right? Tony Bennett is, I mean, really, you know, his feet are kind of the, I don't think they won a championship in 19, but like five years later, I mean, they've had nothing that resembles a team that could accomplish anything that that UVA team did. You think about right. Kansas, right? Bill self has, has talked about, you know, I'm already, when he, when they lost, I'm already thinking about next year. And like, he's not wrong to, because we knew this team couldn't go to a final four. We do. It's like, you've got five players. And if you have got four of them, you know, with McCullers out, and then really, if you make it three and a half with Dickinson's injury, like we know you can't, we know you have a limit. Right. I mean, we even knew with five players, they had a limit. So he's, he's talking about the thought, you know, about what he has to do. Cal at Kentucky was a big talking point. All right. Can mm-hmm. you, can you keep playing this up and down style? Is this really how you can, you know, you make this happen. And and so all these coaches have to figure out, all right, how do I maintain the things that have been great about what we've done at this program while twisting? And I, I'm, ex- I'm for, for Scott Drew, I'm actually excited to see what it is. And I'm, I'm obviously very excited that he's staying too. Yeah. It's, it's huge for Baylor fans. And I mean, just the amount of traction, the amount of noise that was made just from Baylor fans of just, wow, I, what would we do without Scott Drew? What, what's Baylor going to do? What's, what could be next for Baylor? I mean, it just did not, none of the options sounded as appealing. And I know there's a lot of guys in his coaching tree that are awesome with Tang and McCaslin and Mills. And everyone wants to talk about those guys. I like a lot of those guys, but they're not Scott Drew. And so that's the hard part. It's just kind of, you really got to see how much Baylor values him. And and I think it's huge that he's coming back great for the program. And I I think they're going to take steps in the right direction uh, coming up this season through the transfer portal and a, a really good recruiting class. All right, so let's talk some football. So uh, we've been doing this quarterback discussion about you know where quarterback battles are. Uh, let's just let's just say it. there's there's no quarterback battle at Baylor, right? Daquan Finn, they bring him in from Toledo. He is going to be the starter. You know, okay, Josh. So we you were actually te- we were texting a little bit about this, and I, I since we started texting about it, and I, I firmly believe he is. I believe Daquan Finn is going to be the starting quarterback to transfer from Toledo, but. But big butt, it's a battle. They they're allowing these guys to have oh. a full on battle, and it is honestly pretty shocking to me that it that it's come to this. But I, you know, I think that a big part of this, and kind of something that I guess you know maybe I, I think everyone just assumes when you go out and you spend nil and you use nil to go get a quarterback that was in the top ten rankings for quarterback uh, transfer portal quarterbacks, you expect him to just come in and start. Um, but I think it's important to remember Baylor did use NIL to get Sora Robertson last year. They won a head-to-head battle against TCU coming off of their national championship appearance, and they were able to get him over TCU, and they brought him in. He couldn't win the battle over Blake Shape, and a lot of that had to do with his inexperience in the wide zone offense coming from an air raid scheme at Mississippi State. Um, and so it hurt him. He, he just couldn't quite get it all together. But I think we saw at times last year, he did show some flashes. The Utah game and then last game of the year against West Virginia. He actually played you know, really well in that game. Um, but I think in general, this is a situation where this offseason, an air raid offense with Jake Spavita has come in and Sora Robertson feels really comfortable in it and is throwing the football really, really well. And every single day, he just seems to be winning the day. And I think as you stack more and more of those days, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Now, the one thing I will say, uh, the things they're working against Daquan Finn right now are they're not running him a ton, which is a huge thing that he brings to the table. I think they're kind of trying to pump the brakes a little bit and not have him run around all over the place and potentially get hurt. They're having him stand in the pocket, read defenses, and make throws. And so the question is, is that just completely hampering his game to the point where, hey, Sora looks better standing in the pocket, but when the game actually happens, is Finn going to kind of take over in that regard. And I think that's kind of the things that are being worked on. But, you know, I I mean, I, 
I would say at this point, I was a little bit wrong into assuming that this was not going to be a battle. And I think most people thought it wasn't going to be a battle, um, but they're letting these things play out. And I actually, at this moment, expect it to drag all the way into fall camp now. So two things on this. Number one, I've, I've lamented the lack of depth at quarterback in this league. And I understand why, but the lap, lack of depth at quarterback in this league, because when I think about the quarterbacks around, you know, I think about there's, cause there's a bunch of incumbent starters who are not going to be graduating. Uh, Noah Fafita is an example of this Rocco Becht. Uh, I think Baron Morton's not, I mean, he's a senior, but like, I think he's got, well, I, he's been he around does. forever, but he's got yeah. two. Does he have two years. Of two. Left? Mm-hmm. Yeah, two. Right. So he's an incumbent. He's got, uh, you know, more time. Uh, obviously, uh, Avery Johnson at K state is expected to be around for a while. And so, you know, I, I wanted to see if there's going to be some competition, not competition. I mean, like, I, I think this is what I want to see, right? Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, we think it's going to be Daquan Finn, right? But it's nice to see a guy that's invested a lot in Robertson getting the chance. Second part, I think that speaks to the desperation of, and I mean positive in a way, the desperation of the staff, right, Grayson? Because they have, they have to get this right. There is, yeah. if you get this wrong, it, you are going to be fine. You're going to be selling, putting them for sale sign up in front of the house. And so like Correct. this, you have to make sure you make the right choice. Yeah. And, and you know, I've been pretty, um, pretty vocal about this on Sikkim 365, that if Daquan Finn doesn't start, I think it's a, a pretty big failure of the staff. But the flip side of it is, is that, well, you know, you got two guys, the odds of you getting it right are probably pretty high. They're probably raised. And so I think there is something to what you're talking about. It's like we had to, you know, you know Baylor's like, we got to get this quarterback position right. It doesn't matter what we spend on it. We got to make sure that it is ready to go for the season, that we have someone. I'll also say this, you know, I think it's a kind of a, a hidden storyline, but I think true and truly, I, I think Baylor wants Daquan Finn to be their starting quarterback this year, but I also think they want Sora Robertson to be their starting quarterback next year. Right. And I, I think in order for that to happen, I think you need to have a true competition because Sora does have another year. And I think there is a belief that he's really good and that he can be really good in this offense, especially in an, in second year of Jake's Babaton and all these things. But you got to get there first because you're absolutely right. There's a lot of pressure on this Baylor staff. Uh, this this season, they got to get it right. They got to make a bowl. They got to turn things around and actually be competitive in every game, which they weren't last year. Yeah, uh, and, and I mean, how do how does how does how do you feel about Jake Spavital year two? Because like, I mean, he's it's perceived as I, I haven't watched a, I didn't watch really a whole lot of him at, at Texas State. I didn't really see how the offense changed at all. But uh, what what version of the air raid are we currently at? Right, because there's there's several versions of the air raid. Uh, and honestly, some of them are not very air raid, right? There, it's like the run down the middle, throw to the outside type air raid, or there is like the let's just run mesh air raid, right? Um, so where are we? Yeah. Because that could give a indicator about where this competition might be leaning. Yeah, you know, I think that Spav had a lot of problems at Texas State, just from a philosophical standpoint of trying to be a head coach and you know using the transfer portal too exclusively much using the transfer, the transfer portal, portal in that in that case, right? Correct. Correct. And so he goes to Cal for a year and they had a lot of success at Cal. Like offensively, they were actually really fun and they had a freshman quarterback and he was getting a lot out of that freshman quarterback and they found ways to be in games. And so I'm pretty optimistic. He comes to Baylor now and, you know, an area that Baylor's got to just get better at is they got to be more explosive. They've just been really boring offensively. And it was fine when you had the best offensive line in the league and you could just run over everyone, which they did in 2021 and occasionally in 2022. But when the offensive line was gone, they didn't have a counter in that offense. And that's how the wide zone is. If you can't run the football, it's really hard to be successful in a wide zone scheme. So Jake Spavitaw comes in. They're going to run a lot more screens. They are going to run the ball up the middle quite a bit, more inside zone than outside zone. Um, But then they're also going to be explosive down the field. And that's been a huge thing for them. They went out, got two transfer wide receivers, got two transfer offensive linemen, um, a transfer quarterback. Um, They just want to be more explosive. They want to throw the ball more, but they also want to focus on we're going to run the ball up the middle. We're going to get rid of negative plays, which destroyed Baylor last year. They were in second and 12 pretty much the whole season, it felt like. Um, so making sure that they're in positive down and distances, 
and giving their quarterback a true chance in the pocket, which unfortunately they did not do with Blake Shapin or Sora Robertson for much of last year. All right, year. so opening day. I forgot who, who's their first game this year. Tarleton. Oh, so you Tarleton can State. you can fake the quarterback battle there if you want to. But here's what here's yeah. what I'll say. I've said this a bunch, and I, I like to say it a lot because it was a great piece of advice. And I know you've spoken with the with the guys over at, at XM, uh, Gabe Biker and Chris Plank. And Gabe played at Oklahoma playing center. And the one thing he always mentioned was like, it's really good to know who the quarterback is. Like there is, they're absolutely, mm-hmm. they're absolutely from a locker room standpoint, a confidence standpoint, is something to that. And I'm, I'm going to listen to the uh, the, you know, the multi time All American center when it when it comes to yeah. things of that nature. So, do you think this goes all the way to opening day? Do you think the team will know, and maybe we don't know? And then who do you think it is? So I don't think there's any chance that Baylor names a starting quarterback in the spring if it's not Daquan Finn. Like, I, I don't think you're naming Sora Robertson in the spring. I, I don't see that at all. Um, if Finn comes out in the spring game and puts on a show, I do think they will name him the starting quarterback. Um, but as of right now, I, I just I have a hunch that this is going to go into the fall. Um, we saw when Dave Randa made that decision a couple years ago when he chose Blake Shapin over Gary Bohannon. Um, yeah, you gave Gary a chance to transfer and go play somewhere else, but maybe you should have just waited till the till the fall and kept both of them. Um, and so either way, I think this goes to the fall at this point. And, and I think I understand what Gabe is saying, and I do think that's right. You want to have your quarterback. Um, the good news for Baylor is that both these guys are old, mature, veteran guys who are very good leaders. And I think for that reason, you can let it drag out because they both have the respect of the team. And so for that reason, um, I do think it goes to the fall. Um, ultimately, I still think it's going to be Daquan Finn, but I think Sora Robertson's making a very nice push. Awesome. Grayson, where can folks find you and your work and all of its variety? Yeah, so on Twitter, um, I'm at Gray Grunhafer. Uh, on Twitter, Sikkim365. On the premium side, I, I'm all kinds of news, notes, um, opinions. I got insider notes for football for Baylor specifically. Uh, as we get closer to the season, I do season predictions for every single Baylor game as well. Um, so be on the lookout for that in the summer. That's kind of my main Big 12 content um, for the season. But yeah, I mean, thanks for having me on, Josh. And that that's pretty much where you can find me now. And also, Crystal Ball College Football, once the season starts up, I'll have more of that as well. It'll be great to be back on the channel with you. It'll be nice to, uh, to share the channel once again. Yeah. All right, man. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah.